Kenneth MacDonald and welcome to this, the latest event in this year's Big Bang Week. And I think it's appropriate if we're going to be talking about astrophysics to um, start by talking about um, revolutionary socialism uh, because there was a, a group in Scotland of revolutionary socialists in, in the 1970s who tried to prove their mettle by always meeting at 3pm on a Saturday afternoon to prove that the the draw of football could be overcome in the interests of of the revolution and it shows that well here we are at 3 p.m on a saturday afternoon and we too are so keen that we want to discuss well everything really because we do have a, a big question to deal with this afternoon where is the universe now easy answer would be well it's here and there and everywhere but 99 percent of it is invisible now that might not seem like too much of a problem given that all the stuff we need is readily to hand and we, we can see that but our guest would like to disabuse you of that and tell us a scientific detective story. Dr Matthew Bothwell is public astronomer at the University of Cambridge and when he's not doing that he studies the evolution of galaxies. We're going to be talking about his book, this book, The Invisible Universe and uh, you can join him by sending us questions in the comments section down below on YouTube. Uh, let me say hello, Dr. Matt Bothwell. Good afternoon. Hey, doing? Um, absolute pleasure to be here. I'm very, yeah, very excited to dig into these things. I think you're talking about the the missing universe. I don't know it's, it's stuff I'm fascinated by. So, um, yeah, it's always very fun to talk about. Yes, when you look at the billions of stars out there, only some of which we we can see with the naked eye or even with the telescope, you think we've got enough universe to be getting on with. But before before we get to that question, what is a public astronomer? It sounds a bit like a public intellectual, but with a telescope. <laughs> well, so yes, yeah, so my job is is public astronomer at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. Um, it basically means um, that I'm a science communicator. Um, so I don't do that much full-time research anymore. My full-time job now is talking about astronomy. And that means everything from giving public lectures and going into schools, talking to, to kids and running stargazing evenings, uh, to um, writing books like The Invisible Universe. So I'm, I'm the sort of the interface between fundamental science and the public, basically. And the universe in, in your book, it, it, there are actually two different types of invisibility. There's, there's the stuff that we... Yeah can't immediately see and there's the stuff that we know has to be there but we don't even know what it is yet right well yeah this is a sort of a categorization i sort of invented for the book right because there are invisible things all around us right so those of you watching this on some kind of wireless device will know right there is information from your router going to your laptop and which is giving you the internet and letting you like receive these messages like you know that's there right but you can't see it with our eyes but you can pick it up perfectly easily if you have uh like a wireless card like you have in your laptop right um or radio telescopes or you know all the radio in your car right can pick up these invisible radio waves where they're perfectly detectable we just can't happen to see them with our eyes but there is stuff in the universe that is even more invisible than that um, so this is, I think in the book, I call it this type two invisibility. And that's the stuff that uh, we scientists call dark matter. Um, and that's this stuff, and I'm sure we can get into this more, but it's this stuff that the universe appears to be full of, right? The universe seems to be full of this invisible stuff, this ocean of particles, and they are there. We can see the effects, but as far as we can tell, we can't see them at any wavelength. Um, so you can look across the entire spectrum with any kind of telescope you could dream of, and these things are completely missing. They are impossible to see, even though they're there, which is very, very strange. And a, a big part of modern physics is getting to the bottom of exactly what's going, what's going on with that. We, we, we'll get to the dark stuff in, in a wee while, and the data people want to ask questions about that, as I say, down below, and uh, they will get to me, and then I'll ask them of you, Matt, and it will make me sound intelligent. But the, the, the book starts with you looking at, well, stuff we can see, that that 1% one, 1 with a headache in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Now, what, what are you doing there? Yeah, so this was an observing trip I took as a, as a postdoc. So I, w I went to the Atacama Desert because that's one of the best places in the world to stargaze um, because what's, you know, being on Earth is actually quite a terrible place to see the universe, right? Because we're sitting below hundreds of miles of, of damp gas that the light has to get through to reach us. So what we want to do is get as high as possible and as dry as possible to see the universe. So there are places like like in Hawaii, in Australia, and the Atacama Desert in Chile. So what I was doing, I was using 
um, a telescope uh, called the VLT, the very, <laughs> the very Large Telescope. Astronomers are not very inventive when it comes to telescope name. Um, and I was looking at a very, very distant galaxy. Um, so, so viewers might have come across the idea that when you look far away in space, you're also looking back in time, right? So if you look a thousand light years away, then that light took a thousand years to reach you. So you're effectively looking a thousand years back in time. And if you want to look further and further and further back in time, all you have to do is look further and further and further away. Um, so what I'm doing at the start of the book in the Atacama Desert is looking at a galaxy that is very far away indeed, um, about 10 billion years in the past, um, which is um, you know relatively soon after the Big Bang, right? It's uh, when the universe was only about five or 10% of its current age. It's basically a baby galaxy that's just formed after the Big Bang. And so I'm looking at it in infrared and dealing with this altitude headache, um, like you said. Um, it's, no, it's, just, it's, it's a part of my research career I really loved and remember fondly. And you're doing it in the infrared because, well, because the visible spectrum that, that we can see is, is only a very small slice of, of the electromagnetic spectrum and we can sense so much more. Right, exactly. Yeah, so I think I, I opened with the book with this metaphor, which is... Something that I, I remember learning about this in university, but it never really sunk home until I worked out, you know, kind of how ridiculous it was. So, yes, the light we can see with our eyes is only a very tiny part of the whole electromagnetic spectrum, right? So there are all these different kinds of light, like visible light and then infrared and ultraviolet and X-rays and radio waves. These are all different wavelengths of light, right, all on this kind of spectrum. And yes, I remember hearing about the light we see with our eyes is only a small part of the total. But when you work out what a small part it is, it's genuinely remarkable. Um, a nice analogy, I think, is that our eyes can see about a factor of two in wavelength. So like the reddest light we can see, the waves are twice as big as the bluest light we can see. A factor of two in wavelength also has meaning when we talk about music, right? So anyone sort of musically inclined, think of an octave on the piano. So like a note, the note that sounds the same a bit higher. That's also a factor of two in wavelength. So we can sort of like draw a bit of an analogy and say that we can see one octave of light, right? Like that's our window to the universe. And then you can immediately ask the question, well, okay, if we can see one octave of light, how wide is the whole thing, right? And the answer is it's about 65 octaves in total. That's like nine grand pianos <laughs> standing in a line, right? Like that's all the information that's raining down on us from the universe at all times. And our own eyes can only perceive one octave. Um, it's just, it's a staggering amount of stuff to be completely oblivious of. It's, it's amazing. And that explains why, for example, the James Webb Space Telescope isn't going to be looking in the visible spectrum. People are going to be a bit disappointed they're not going to get the, the beautiful images for, that we get from the Hubble, but it potentially is going to be so much more valuable. Well, it, it will be, yes. And I think we, we will still get very, very beautiful images. We'll have to translate them into visible light. So, yes, the James Webb, uh, which launched on Christmas Day, I don't know if you watched it. I, I was glued to it. I kind of kept on telling my family to ignore their turkey and presents and come and watch this, like, come and watch this launch. So, yeah, the James Webb is sort of like an infrared version of Hubble. And uh, it, so it, it will be much more valuable. It's much more powerful, right? Like Hubble is 1980s technology. Um, so James Webb is far more powerful, far more advanced, and it will get beautiful images. Um, it will take beautiful images in the infrared, which is light that we can't see. But there's nothing stopping us sort of translating those images into, you know, into image pictures we can see. And bit kind of the same way you might take the squeaks of a bat and turn it into noise we can hear. Um, so it will, it will still produce very, very pretty images, as well as revolutionizing our view of the cosmos. It is remarkable. It certainly strikes me anyway that... Well, just over a, a, a century ago, they were still debating whether or not the Milky Way was the only galaxy in existence. And now we're looking at ones which are so far away, and there are so many of them. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely incredible. Um, yes, yeah, so there was this in uh, this period in astronomy, there was this event known as the Great Debate, which was basically this big argument about whether the Milky Way was the only thing in the universe or whether our Milky Way was just a small speck adrift in a much larger, larger void. And of course, everyone that nowadays knows that the Milky Way is just a, a speck in a much bigger void. Um, yeah, like you said, it's extraordinary that only 100 years ago, we didn't know that was true. What, I, what always strikes me is that that's 
was after Einstein, right? So when Einstein was coming up with his, his theories of general relativity, like the theory that best describes the space and time of the universe, he thought he was living in this like Milky Way pocket sized universe. <laughs> like Einstein didn't know how big the universe was when he was describing it really perfectly, which is, I just think is absolutely amazing. That, that in itself is remarkable. And not relatively speaking, not too long, certainly in astronomical time and or cosmological time, not too long before that, people were, were still uh, d debating about whether light had any speed at all or whether it was just instantaneous because you turn on the light and it comes on. How would it have to travel at any kind of speed? Well, right, exactly. I think I think Douglas Adams said something like this. But yeah, like light travel, it's tr light travels so much faster than anything we're ever familiar with. It takes a real sort of leap of leap of leap of imagination to realize that it's traveling at all, right? Um, it does look basically instantaneous. Um, and I, I, I find like the history of of the science of light a really interesting sort of like test study for how science works because. You don't have to go very far, you know, comparatively in cosmic history, you know, in cosmic history, a couple of thousand years when the cutting edge science of the time believed ridiculous things about light. Right. Ancient Greek philosophers like people like Plato and Aristotle believe that light came outwards from our eyes like we were kind of Marvel superheroes or something. Um, you know, which sounds, sounds ridiculous to us now, but I think that's only because we were raised with the correct, you know, with the correct science. Like people working it out from scratch came up with these sort of crazy ideas. And so our modern picture of light, that it sort of bounces around the universe very, very fast and comes out of stars and goes into our eyes. That's like the end point of hundreds of years of lots of debate and thought and all that kind of stuff. I, mean, I always find it fascinating thinking about these these base level assumptions about reality that we just learn in primary school and take for granted are a very, very, very hard won facts. Well, yes, you mentioned Democritus here as well, and his idea of how we saw things, like if you look at an antelope or something like that, that 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 was a fascinating theory, and for want of any other theory, certainly made sense at the time. We're just wrong. Yes, exactly. So that was that was the one about um, like he he thought you we. You could see objects because very very thin films were from the objects were sort of being expelled at all times i think he called them idler meaning images and so yeah if you look at an antelope or whatever then little kind of thin films of antelope were just radiating outwards from this all the time um which like sounds completely bonkers nowadays but um but there you go <laughs> but it's it, it's it's like all theories it's it's based on observation and you postulate a theory and if somebody knocks it down then that's actually Potentially good news, not, not not good for your ego, but but nevertheless, that's how science works. Do you think enough people I mean, recognize yeah, I mean, how science works? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sci scientists love being wrong, right? I mean, if we if we if if we were right about everything, there'd be no reason to to do science, right? If science knew everything, it would stop, as you know, Darrow Breen very famously said. Um, so yeah, like science, you know, we we learn by being wrong. I think the most interesting question when we think about this kind of stuff is what are people in the future going to look back on us and find equally ridiculous, right? It's like, because, you know, the ancient Greeks were not, a, you know, stupid people, right? They came up with really fundamental things to do with mathematics and geometry and engineering that we still use today. Um, but, you know, they had some crazy ideas. You know, people in the year 3000 might look back on our society and some of our scientific ideas and think we were being ridiculous. Um, who knows? I mean, I, I would love to know what they're going to be. Unfortunately, I probably won't. Really <laughs> this is the problem. There is a need for, for for humility in science, but you don't want to you don't want to doubt anything because this is the working proposition until we get a better working proposition. Yeah, exactly. Like so, science, I, I always think like science is a verb, right? It's like science is a way of analysing the world with a level of humility and you know, an understanding to be wrong. And I think it's the best method we've got. You know, and like it, it leads to a lot of doubt and uncertainty. Like sometimes the best scientific answer you can give is, I don't know, but I'm going to try and find out. Um, you know, like science doesn't give you certainty, but it's, it's, it's kind of the best thing we have, unfortunately, for understanding the world. Well, so, for example, that reminds me of um, Professor Sir Fred Hoyle, who I, I was actually lucky when I was a callow schoolboy to, to see giving a public lecture. And wow. he was he, he was great. He, he was really good. Strong Manchester accent. Mm -hmm. um, no nonsense, as, as they used to say. He didn't buy, for example, the idea that the universe was expanding. Not, not initially. It was just there. That's what that was the prevailing view. It was just there. What changed people's minds? What did change Fred Hoyle's mind? Because he he did eventually come out with with a different theory. 
so he did so yeah so i think so, so i think i think nothing changed fred hoyle's mind right so yeah so fred hoyle was very opposed to this idea and he he, he went to his grave thinking this were true so if, if we go back a hundred years to you know when we thought the, the, the universe was this sort of pocket-sized universe people also thought that the universe had been around forever it's one of the central pillars of our understanding of the universe that it was infinitely old um, the idea that the universe might have been created at some point was almost seen as like a dangerously religious idea, right? You know, if you were a sober person of science, you believe that the universe was infinitely old. Um, like the real, the, the sort of the first brick or the first rock in the avalanche was this American astronomer called Edwin Hubble, um, who observed galaxies all the way around the sky and saw that they were all moving away from us. Uh, so every galaxy seemed to be sort of moving away from the Milky Way. And they were moving with this particular pattern where like the further away a galaxy was, the faster it was moving. And that is the telltale smoking gun signature of a, a universe which is expanding. And so, you know, that was a bit of a shock in itself. But then that leads people to go back and reevaluate that pillar, which they thought they had before. Right. Like if you think the universe is infinitely old and has been sitting there unchanging, it's a bit of a shock to find out that your universe is growing and growing and growing. Right. If you see something growing, it stands to reason that could, should have been some beginning point to start off the growth right if you see an oak tree growing it makes sense that at one point it was an acorn and so yeah seeing the expanding universe people immediately thought well you know like if you rewind the tape back to the beginning was there a starting point to the universe um we now know the answer is of course yes and that's what we call the big bang it was this sort of enormous explosion of matter and energy what it, energy initially then the energy cooled down to become matter that started our universe, but this was very controversial. And later, like, Fred Hoyle, like you said, hated the idea of the Big Bang. He spent his entire career arguing that there was no Big Bang and the universe had been around forever. He did modify his idea, though, and it came up with this idea of, of the, the, the the steady state, whereas the, the more was there was a kind of horn of plenty at the, at the middle of the universe, which was pumping out more matter, which then shot yeah. away. Exactly. Yeah. So Fred, Fred Hall's idea, because the, the big problem that they had, so the H Hubble's observations, you couldn't argue with, right? Like the universe did very much look like it was getting bigger. All galaxies were definitively getting further and further apart. And so the challenge for Fred Hoyle, the challenge for all these scientists that didn't want there to be a Big Bang was, how do you explain the fact that all these galaxies are moving further and further apart, but without some beginning point to kick it off? And yeah, so as you said, Fred Hoyle came up with this theory called the steady state theory. And yeah, his theory is basically that empty space can spontaneously generate stuff, generate atoms, if you leave it alone long enough. And so basically what happens is all the galaxies move further and further apart, and then new stuff, new matter is spontaneously generated in the space left behind. And then that forms into galaxies and those galaxies move apart and that just whole process goes round and round and round forever. Um, it's a pretty genius idea. Apparently he came up with this idea. He There was a, a Twilight Zone-esque kind of film where the, the, the film itself is a loop and the end is the same as the beginning. And apparently he watched this film and that gave him the brainwave of this sort of loopy like loop universe that discovery goes round and round. I always think of it as like an MC Escher staircase universe. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I kind of get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, but fundamentally stay the same. We, we're talking about our universe as if it's the only universe, and it might not be. That's that's what one of the interesting possibilities that that some theory some theories throw up. Because one of the one of the great it's, it's a really good idea that that you deal with in, in this book is how come we're lucky enough to be able to see all this stuff because this is the anthropic universe. You better explain what what that is. Well, yes, I, I think just on, on the one really quick thing on the previous point, I should point out that Fred Hoyle was wrong, right? Like, you know, he came up with a steady state theory. It was, a, you know, kind of an ingenious sort of fudge to try and make the, the facts fit his preconceived idea. But yeah, he was unfortunately wrong. You know, the universe did start with a big bang. It's just worth saying. Um, yes, like, yeah, the, the, the anthropic universe, the idea that there might be multiple universes, this is... I, I'm, I'm really, really fascinated by this idea. This The whole idea comes with a big speculation warning, right? Um, like, you know, there are some things in cosmology and science that we have pretty concrete evidence for, like the idea that the Big Bang happened. We are about as certain as that as we are of, you know, anything in science, like the theory of evolution, right? You know, it's, it's about as concrete as something can be in science. Uh, when we talk on, about multiple universes, we 
very much have to kind of plaster speculation warnings <laughs> around the whole thing. Um, but it comes down to this basic idea that our universe seems to be very nicely sort of finely tuned for life. Um, like when you look around our universe, there are these sort of physical, what we what at times we call physical constants built into the fabric of, of our universe. For example, how strong gravity is or how strong dark energy is or how strong the forces that stick atoms together are, right? These seem to be numbers that are sort of built into our universe in some way. And the question really is, or, or you know, the, the observation really is that these numbers seem perfectly set up to allow a bunch of complex stuff in our universe to form, right? Um, like our universe clearly contains a lot of complexity. It contains stars and planets and galaxies and people and politicians and caps and all kinds of crazy things, right? Like how do the laws of our, of our universe lead to this complexity? And it does seem that if the laws of the universe were slightly different, we might not have these things. Like you know, it would take only a very small tweak to the strength of the forces that hold atoms together and we wouldn't be able to get stars to form. Um, it would take only a small tweak to the strength of dark energy and the universe might tear itself apart a second after the Big Bang. It seems like we've sort of won the cosmic lottery that all these numbers are exactly what we need to create things like stars and planets and galaxies and life. And so, you know, this is a problem, right? Because scientists don't like coincidence. It's like, you know, how do we have this, what appears to be millions and millions of one coincidence? And the answer might, you know, speculation warning, speculation warning, the answer might be that there are lots and lots of universes and that the physical constants of the universe that I've been talking about are sort of baked in at the moment of the Big Bang. And so, yeah, the universe next door, if you like, might have sort of different values and that universe might be completely barren. Um, so our universe might well be millions to millions to one, but it's not that we won the cosmic lottery, it's that we live in a habitable universe because... Of course we do. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, we wouldn't be here to ask the question if we weren't in the habitable universe. Well, let's let's stick to our anthropic habitable <laughs> u universe at the, at the right, moment. Right. Well, there are lots of interesting stories in here about references to Monty Python and Douglas Adams as well. But it, it, interesting stories about, for example, how we know or how we as, are as sure as we can be that the Big Bang happened. And one of the most fundamental discoveries was made by people who weren't looking for it, and it involves pigeon droppings. <laughs> yeah, this is, I, I do love this story. So, yes, yeah, so if, if we go back to the story we had before with Fred Hoyle and the steady state universe, at the start of the 1960s, the the physics world was really split on whether the Big Bang happened. I think I'd even at a conference of astronomers, they did a kind of a straw poll and they found out there was about a 50-50 split between yes and no on the Big Bang. Um, the real problem was we didn't know where to look for evidence, right? You know, that's the way questions get settled in science. You have these two differing explanations for the universe and then hopefully a piece of evidence will come along and show you which one's right. And so the real, the real question was where might there be evidence that the Big Bang happens? Uh, and so people realize, okay, well, there's a prediction that the Big Bang Theory makes, right? So the Big Bang Theory says that the universe was once very, very small and hot and dense and expanded out and has become the sort of the cold, desolate, empty universe that we know and love. Once, if the universe was small and hot and dense, because all the matter and energy and stuff in the universe was squashed into a small volume, the whole the universe should be glowing, right? Because hot things glow. Think of putting a red iron, you know, a red hot bar in a forge or something, right? hot things glow. And so if the early universe after the Big Bang was was hot and dense, it should be glowing. And we should be able to see the evidence for that glow. Like the photons emitted by the glowing universe should still be around in the universe if we know where to go and look for them. Um, but people didn't know where, right? So this kind of, this stalled for 20 or 30 years. Uh, and then, as you said, people that weren't even looking for it, there were two people called Penzias and Wilson. Uh, they were engineers who worked for Bell Labs, uh, a telephone company in the US, um, because one of the big tech problems to solve in the 1960s was how to talk over long distances. This is before we had satellites and before we had an easy way of talking over thousands of miles. And there was an idea to use microwaves. Um, you have very powerful microwave transmitters and then very powerful microwave receivers. And then in theory, you could talk between continents in real time. So Bell Labs spent a lot of money and built a microwave receiver in America to listen to these faint microwave signals from the other side of the world. And when they switched their machine on, they had this sort of irritating, fuzzy, staticky buzz um, in their receiver. 
and they had no idea what it was. They drove them crazy. They spent months sort of rewiring and resoldering. And, uh, you know, as you said, for a while, they'd become convinced it was pigeons. <laughs> um, they had a pretty unpleasant week, I think, kind of scrubbing pigeon droppings off the receivers. Um, but nothing they could do could, could fix the problem. Um, and there's, there's, there is one of these weird coincidences of history at this point. Because like I said, these Penzias and Wilson, they were telephone engineers. I don't think they were aware of this cutting edge problem of whether the Big Bang happens. They happened to have a friend in common who knew some astronomers in Chicago that were working on the problem. And, you know, it, it almost plays out like a comedy sketch, right? If you, if you imagine this friend, he's got his, uh, you know, his telephone engineer friend saying, we've got this really powerful microwave receiver and we're picking up this mysterious signal. We've got no idea what it's about and it's driving us mad. And they've got their astronomer friend saying, we're desperately trying to find out if the Big Bang happened. And if it did, there should be a signal everywhere. And we have no idea where to look for it. <laughs> Um, and then luckily connected the two, um, these the two engineers won the Nobel Prize in physics for their discovery. And ever since the early 1960s, we've known that the universe started with a Big Bang. This signal uh, they were picking up was this sort of leftover afterglow radiation from when the universe was very, very young and hot after the Big Bang. Um, we've spent decades studying that radiation. Um, one of the headline results in the 1990s was sort of studying what we call the power spectrum of the CMB and the, 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 like the, the black body spectrum of the CMB, basically looking at like the patterns and the temperatures in the CMB. And they are the most beautiful and exact match to theoretical predictions in the entire history of science, right? You take your kind of like physics textbook and you work out what the CMB should look like, and then you compare it to the real observation and the match is perfect beyond belief. Um, which is why we are very, very certain that our universe started with the Big Bang. We have this exquisite match between prediction and uh, and reality. It, 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 as, as you were saying earlier on, I mean, long ago and far away are, are the same thing, if you like. If you're looking at something a billion light years away, the, the, you, you do it. There's a tremendous example in, in, in your book of this, where, where you're observing these galaxies from the Atacama, or this particular galaxy, from the Atacama Desert, and you tell the story of the photons as they travel towards your charge-coupled devices, as, as it would be. Mm -hmm. It's a yeah. remarkable odyssey. Well, they, they, I mean, it really is, yeah. I always... It's just about trying to convey that span of time. Yes, the idea that this light spent 10 billion years going through space, it's its longer than, you know, it's its an unfathomable amount of time, right? The human brain did not evolve to understand spans of time like 10 billion years. Um, I think the, the first thing that, what, what made me kind of really want to tell this sort of photons eye view odyssey of the journey is realizing that, I had the realization that photons would have been entering our Milky Way galaxy, you know, the very, very, very final stop of the journey. You know, imagine driving across a continent and then, you know, the moment that you turn into your driveway, basically, at like the very end of the journey, the photons would be entering our Milky Way galaxy around the time that human beings evolved on the plains of Africa. You know, and it's like the, 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 the difference between those two like time scales, right? Like, for, so from the photon point of view, it's the very, very, very last step. But from a human point of view, it's or of human history, you know, going back two hundred thousand years. Um, I don't know. It's just like the, the kind of the the, the, the handoff between those two vast timescales. I find really fascinating. You you, you talk about the, the the way in which, uh, I, I, as you were saying, I, how far away things were, how long they get to be here. At one point, you're talking about looking at things which are actually further away than the universe is old, if, if that's a way of putting it. it more than 13.8 billion light years away, which means before the Big Bang. That, that again, to our brains, that does not make sense. Sure. Well, I think it's, it's, it's not actually that complex to understand, but yeah, it is very counterintuitive because yes, we know the, the universe is about 13.6 billion years old, right? And we know that light travels through the universe. And so your you know, the first thing to imagine would be that we can't see anything further away than 13.6 billion light years, right? Because that's how old the universe is. That would be true if the universe wasn't expanding, but the universe is expanding. And so, you know, light that set off 10 billion years ago has traveled much, much, much more than 10 billion light years to reach us, right? Like if you could press pause on our universe's expansion and just hold the universe static, then that would be true. Then yes, a, a galaxy 10 billion light years away, uh, the light would get to us and it would be a 10 billion year journey and it would be 10 billion light years away. 
But because the universe is expanding, after the light left, the galaxy is moving further and further and further away. So we're actually seeing something much, much further away than just the light travel time. As an analogy, kind of imagine hearing like a kind of a sonic boom from an aircraft or something. Um, you know, like if you if you hear a sonic boom from an aircraft, and you know the, when the and you hear the boom when the aircraft was sort of ten sound seconds away or something. When you hear that boom, the aircraft is much, much, much further away than 10 sound seconds, right? Because it's been traveling the whole time. So you're actually hearing something that's much, much further away than you would otherwise because it's kind of traveling away. You also t take us through, and, and I'll, I'll show the book again. It's available on the uh, Book Festival website for more orderly queue, please. And indeed, um, keep your uh, questions coming in at, on, on YouTube as well, and I'll, I'll try and I'll try and raise as many of them as I possibly can, although there will inevitably be the, the car crash at the end as everybody tries to get a question in, in the last five minutes, but never mind. Um, it, it, there, are, there are so many fascinating things, just entities out, out there, if you like, dead galaxies for one. How did galaxies die and why are they still there? Um, yeah, good question. I think, I think before we talk about why... Well, before I explain how galaxies can die, it might be worth explaining what it means for a galaxy to be alive. So galaxies have this sort of natural ecosystem or a natural heartbeat or something, which is the creation of stars. Like galaxies are sort of engines for turning gas into stars. And um, in every single, well, the vast majority of galaxies are doing this all the time. Our Milky Way forms a couple of new stars every year on average. Um, the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest galaxy to us, is doing this as well. So if you think of forming new stars as sort of the, you know, the kind of the life cycle engine of galaxies, we can call a galaxy that doesn't do that a dead galaxy. Um, and so there are these, we call them red and dead galaxies, and they're dead because they're not making new stars, and they're red because old stars are red stars. And so if these galaxies haven't made any new stars for the last few billion years, the only stars left are these kind of very red, small geriatric stars, right? So these, yeah, the galaxies are red and dead. And they're, they're fascinating things. And I think, so what I did my, my PhD research on was studying where these red and dead galaxies came from. Like, how do you produce one of these giant dead galaxies? And it, it, there are other, it, some things are more useful than, than others. Pulsars are actually really useful for astronomy, but it, it, in what way? Um, so pulsars are more useful. Is, is it worth explaining to the audience what pulsars are, first of all? Yes, let, let, let's hear it for Jocelyn Bell Bornell, yes. Oh, yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah. So Jocelyn Bell, um, the discoverer of pulsars. So what a, what a pulsar is, it's the remains of a dead star, right? So if a star a bit bigger than the sun dies, um, it will explode in something called a supernova. And the core of the star that's left over will shrink down uh, very small until it's about the size of a city or something. So you basically have the remains of a star crushed down until it's just a few miles wide and they can have very very strong magnetic fields and they can kind of end up shooting radiation from their poles and because these things are spinning they act a bit like cosmic lighthouses and if you get caught in the beam um you know you'll see this lighthouse passing you and passing you and passing you and so you will see a radio pulse in your telescope as this lighthouse beam ticks over you um as you said yeah uh, discovered first by jocelyn bell Bennell. uh and 1960s, and they, they really, they have changed physics. I think uh, the, so I've, I've forgotten who it was that called them this, but some people call pulsars nature's gift to physicists. Um, they, they do an enormous amount for us. And first of all, even the discovery of pulsars full stop taught us um, about exotic new states of matter that we didn't like previously dream of. I mean, to, to take an entire star and squash it down into the size of a city, it has to be unbelievably dense. Um, the state, you know, a, a teaspoonful of pulse of pulsar material would weigh millions and millions of tons, like per teaspoon. So, you know, te just the discovery that these exotic states of matter can exist are amazing. Um, the other reason they are very useful is that I described them with these cosmic lighthouses, kind of causing pulses in our telescopes. The the timing of these pulses is amazingly precise, like you know, down to a, a millionth of a millionth of a second precision. And so that means that they're essentially atomic clocks, right? I mean, I think about all the kind of the wonderful experiments we can do on here on Earth with atomic clocks if we want to time things accurately. It's basically as if the universe has built us a bunch of atomic clocks in the universe that we can use for testing things like how space and time change and all that kind of stuff. Um, they are amazingly useful. Um, some, uh, the, some confirmations 
of, of relativity. Um, Einstein's great theory come from pulsars. Um, the first ever exoplanet was discovered um, orbiting uh, one of these pulsars. Um, so yeah, they are, they are fun, phenomenally useful things. So tremendously handy. What, what about um, FRBs, fast radio bursts? Uh, they, they seem fascinating. Are, are they going to help us or are they simply mystifying us? Um, so, yeah, right, right now they're sort of mystifying us. Um, they might well help us one day when we understand them a bit better. So a fast radio burst um, is, um, I guess, the clue to the name. It's a bit like very large telescope, right? <laughs> 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 the obvious names. Um, a fast radio burst is a very fast radio burst from space. It's a burst of radio waves um, just lasting a few sort of microseconds or something coming from the distant universe. Um, we we still don't fully know what these things are. Um, we, we hear these come, things coming from the depths of space, so often coming from many, many billions of light years away. And uh, we have some like un some theories for what they are. Um, we're getting closer to a proper understanding, we think, because uh, a fast radio burst a couple of years ago went off inside our own Milky Way galaxy, right? Normally these things happen halfway across the universe, uh, which makes them quite hard to study and understand what's going on. But one went by, you know, one went off quite close to home and, you know, close to home still means tens of thousands of light years away, but compared to the universe. And it came from something called a magnetar. So a magnetar is a bit like, it's like a cousin of a pulsar, basically. It's a sort of, a, it's a dead, compressed star with a very, very strong magnetic field. And so the fact that we've spotted one of these, these dead stars producing these fast radio bursts sort of suggests that this is maybe one way they could get made. Um, we're still very much in the mystery part of science when it comes to fast radio bursts, right? I mean, often this is the sort of the heartbeat of science is that you accumulate a bunch of data that you don't really understand, and then you come along with a theory and then you explain it and then you become happy, right? So we're still very much in the accumulating mysteries that we don't understand with fast radio bursts. Um, it's absolutely fascinating though, just hearing these kind of bright radio noises coming from the depths of space and not really understanding what they are. And it's, there's something sort of, I don't know, I, I, I imagine being like an old sailor or something and hearing kind of bloops, and bloops from the ocean and wondering what the hell is that? <laughs> yeah, one mystery though, which came up alongside fast radio bursts, which was solved for, uh, for a completely banal reason, was peritons. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So it, it's a kind of a, a slightly funny story when it comes to fast radio bursts. So the, the telescope in Australia that first spotted fast radio bursts was sort of scanning the sky and looking for similar things. And they noticed that they, they detected something which is very, very similar to a fast radio burst. It was this kind of this sweeping, this radio blip that sort of swept down in frequency. And it didn't really look like anything that we recognized in the universe. And they went on detecting these, these things for years. Uh, they called them peritons, uh, which is sort of like an, a, you know, an imaginary beastie type thing. Um, the, so the, yeah, the, the, so the, the real question for years was, you know, what is producing these weird radio sounds? Um, an astronomer correlated the, the arrival timing of these blips with uh, the, the 24 hour clock and realizing that all these blips were happening around lunchtime, <laughs> you know, it tells you it's probably not a coincidence. Um, and what it, it turned out that the microwave in the astronomer's break room uh, was a bit faulty and rubbish and uh, people were opening the door, um, you know, kind of impatient to get their, their lunch or whatever. And a burst of microwaves was escaping and being picked up by the telescope. Mm. So for years and years, astronomers were sort of picking up signals from their microwave and going, hmm, fascinating, what's that? <laughs> Again, that uh, shows the importance of, of humility in science. And exactly. Did, I think in many people's imaginations, the, the most remarkable things that we know of so far in the universe are black holes. And it, it is a, a, a running theme through, through your book, and, and it's a very dryly humorous footnote. You do point out that astronomers are not terribly good at naming things like you know the very large telescope it's called the very large telescope they didn't come up with a snappy name for it and similarly um 3c273 um is incredibly exciting but you wouldn't know that not knowing it's, it's taking it simply from its name <laughs> Yes, exactly. So, yeah, so the, to explain the 3C273, so um, throughout the sort of 1950s, 1960s, Cambridge was one of the centres uh, for radio astronomy in the whole world. 
and we were building radio telescopes here in Cambridge. We were scanning the sky and just making big catalogues of what we saw. And so 3C is the third Cambridge catalogue and 273 is the 273rd entry in that in that catalogue. Um, yes, it's very tedious. Name. I think the problem really is just how big the universe is, right? I mean, all the stars we can see with our naked eye have nice kind of poetic mythological names. But once we built telescopes and we started discovering billions of stars out there in our galaxy, you run out of names. And so you sort of you have to give things pretty tedious names or names that look like phone numbers just as a way to put them in catalogues. Um, it's sort of it's less poetic, but it's more efficient. It, the, the thing about bl black holes is that, again, they, they push our intuition probably beyond it, it, its limits. We just people can't really grasp that it could swallow light but actually the, the the huge size of them leads to things like gravitational lensing which is which is a terrific phenomenon and actually exists absolutely yeah so yeah i mean so you are absolutely right black holes stretch our intuition to breaking points the idea that you can take a, an entire star and compress it down into an infinitesimal point. I mean, so the, the best theories we have of black holes tell us that they are literal points, infinitely small, with the mass of an entire star, which just sort of breaks my brain if I try to think about it. Um, they actually, they actually like stretch the laws of physics to breaking point. Um, we don't have like a full, complete description of how black holes work. And, um, We'll get onto gravitational lensing in a second, but I think it's worth saying that one of the fascinating things about black holes is that they lie in the intersection between these two great physical theories, which makes them hard to explain. So in the 20th century, like the two most successful theories of physics that we have that explain most of the universe are relativity and quantum mechanics. And relativity was Einstein's thing, of course, that describes how space and time work on the biggest scales. So when we talk about the universe as a whole or very, very heavy things, we can use relativity, it works perfectly. And when we want to talk about small things, we use quantum mechanics, right? Quantum mechanics describes how electrons and atoms and all that kind of things work, you know? So the, the, the computer and the device that you're watching this on will be designed with the laws of quantum mechanics in mind because the electrons are scuttling around the wires and doing all kinds of bits. So we have these two amazing theories of the universe. Relativity describes big, heavy things. Quantum mechanics describes small and uh, small things. The problem is these two theories don't play nice together, right? We don't have, we don't know how these two theories like work together, which they should because it's all one universe, right? You know, it's universe on big scales and the universe on small scales. So in theory, they should work together. Um, in practice, we don't know how to make them fit. And the problem is black holes need both, right? Because black holes are very, very heavy things. So we need relativity to describe them, but they're also very, very small. But, you know, the actual singularity is smaller than an atom. So we need quantum mechanics to describe that bit as well. And so black holes sort of lie in this overlap when the overlap is the thing that we don't know how to explain properly. So they are, yeah, they, they are kind of stress, stress testing our laws of physics to the absolute limits. Um, quantum... You mentioned gravitational lensing. I don't know if you want to talk about that. Oh, at all. yes, yes, please. Yeah, so gravitational lensing was... Um, again, one of these things that come out of Einstein's theory and then turned out to be true. So basically the idea is so Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that space and time, like the fabric of the universe is stretchy, sort of like a, you know, the famous analogy is like a rubber sheet. And that's what gravity actually is. It's being in stretchy space and time. Isaac Newton described gravity as a force. Um, so if I take a pencil and drop it, you know, it's being pulled down by a force from the earth. And Einstein said, no, that's not true. There's no force, it's just stretchy, bendy space. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's a much better description of gravity. And that's the kind of, that's the description of gravity modern physics use, uses. Um, but it turns out um, if straight, if space is stretchy and bendy, it can lend things in the same way that um, sort of light passing through glass or like a, a spectacle lens or something will bend and focus and magnify the image, the same thing can happen with space. Um, if you have some very massive thing in the universe, like either a black hole or a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies, it will bend the space around it. And then that space can magnify uh, objects in, in the background. Um, it's sort of like the universe builds as natural telescopes. Um, there are things in the very, very far distant universe, billions of light years away, that we would not be able to see, that they, they would be too faint to see if there wasn't something very, very big in the foreground, bending the space and sort of building a natural magnifying glass to see the distant universe. 
You, you, there is a measurement which is not measured in light years, which seems to be very important, which is in this book, 21 centimetres. And it's all to do with quantum uncertainty, which is certainly a phrase that certainly conjures up my grasp of the subject. <laughs> Right, yeah, so the, well, so the, the 21 centimetre line is uh, a product of the gas hydrogen. Um, so it turns out that hydrogen, like, so hydrogen is the most common substance in the universe, right? Like most of the universe is hydrogen. Hydrogen atoms on their own will naturally produce radio waves, which sounds like a crazy thing to say. Um, so the way, the way it works is, so what a hydrogen atom is, it's a, a single proton and a single electron orbiting around it. And both the proton and the electron are, can be spinning. And so there are two different configurations for a hydrogen atom. The spins can either be pointing in the same direction or they can be pointing in opposite directions. And it turns out one of these states, is you know, one of these orientations has slightly higher energy. And so that's where this quantum uncertainty comes in. So an electron in the uh, in the high energy state can just spontaneously, out of nowhere, sort of suddenly find itself in the low energy state. Um, you know, it can just kind of flip, and there'll be a bit of energy left over, and this gets emitted as a radio wave. So this kind of this spooky quantum weirdness means that hydrogen atom is just on on their own, sitting there in space. No one's looking at them. Will occasionally send out a little radio wave. And this sounds very trivial and incidental, right? I mean, who cares about one atom emitting a little radio wave? But it turns out if you have trillions upon trillions upon trillions of atoms like you do in a galaxy, they'll be sending out loads of these radio waves all the time. And so when we point our telescopes and we look for these 21 centimeter radio waves, we see them absolutely everywhere. And we can use this to paint a picture of all the cold gas in our universe that we would otherwise be completely invisible. Talking of stuff in our universe, which which is invisible, dark matter. You describe going after this stuff as ghost hunting. <laughs> How do we know it's there? How do we know the ghosts are real? Um, so it's a good question. So yeah, dark matter is, I think, one of these things. It's I, I yeah I, I can't wait to find out what the answer is about dark matter. So we we first became aware of dark matter in the 1930s. I think it was there was an astronomer called Fritz Zwicky. Um, who was looking at clusters of galaxies. So imagine like a, a swarm of galaxies kind of all buzzing around each other, like a swarm of midges or something. And what, what Zwicky noticed was that if you look at how fast the galaxies are going, they seem to be going too fast. Like, so you can look at the cluster and look at all the stuff in the cluster and work out how much the cluster weighs. And all the galaxies should have escape velocity, like clusters should all be flying apart but they weren't. And so sort of Zwicky postulated this idea that there might be some invisible stuff. And he literally called it dark matter inside the cluster holding it together. Um, so back in the 1930s, that was just sort of, you know, a, a hypothesis to fit one weird data point. But it just as the century rolled on, it turns out we just saw this again and again and again. So most famously Vera Rubin um, in the 1960s was studying the rotation of galaxies and found exactly the same thing. Galaxies are spinning far too fast like all galaxies should just be flying apart but they're not there's something sort of gluing galaxies together um and uh, yeah so just almost from, from any every era of astronomy we get the same result which is that there seems to be a bunch of invisible stuff in the universe holding things together and we don't really have much of an idea what it is so we call it dark matter um, our best guess is that it is some kind of tiny particle, like some sort of subatomic particle that we haven't found yet that doesn't interact with the light. And that's what makes it dark, right? That's this sort of type two invisibility we spoke about at the start. It's not something that we can see if we use a radio telescope or an X-ray telescope. We can't see it with any kind of telescope because it doesn't emit light at all. Um, the problem with this is that it means it, it makes it very, very hard to catch. So light is an electromagnetic wave, right? So you see, you're seeing our picture right now because electromagnetic waves are leaving your screen and going into your eyes. Um, electromagnetism is also what makes everyday objects interact, right? If I kind of knock on my teacup, what's actually happening is that the electrons in my hand and the electrons in my cup are repelling each other. Right? And that's an electromagnetic interaction. If I could sort of switch off electromagnetism in my hand, my hand could just pass straight through my cup. Right? Atoms are mostly empty space. It's only electromagnetism that stops that from happening. And so dark matter, because it doesn't feel electromagnetism, can just pass through anything. Like dark matter can just pass through the entire Earth as if it was a ghost. 
um, you know, which is all very well and good, but it makes life very hard for scientists because it means it can also pass straight through any conceivable dark matter detecting machine, right? You know, we can build a very, you know, we can go and build a dark matter detector and dark matter will just waltz straight through. Um, so it make, makes it very, very hard to find. We, we, we do have, a, we do think we know how to do it in theory. So matter is mostly empty space, right? So if you imagine zooming in on an atom, it's a nucleus with an electron around the edge. Most of that is empty space, and that's why dark matter can waltz straight through. But we think dark matter should feel the weak force, which is one of these forces that sticks atom atomic nuclei together. So in theory, if a dark matter particle scores a direct hit on an atomic nucleus, it will sort of cause us a bit of a spark and some heat. And so that's the way we think we're going to find it. So to, to find dark matter, they, 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 build, they build these ridiculous detectors deep underground. You'd think it was a crazy place to view the universe. So you go like a mile underground into like an abandoned mine shaft or something and get a big tank of liquid and just get a thousand cameras and stare at that liquid for years and years and years and just wait for the little ping of a dark matter particle hitting a nucleus. Um, in theory, that's how you do it. Um, in practice, we've been doing that for a few decades and we've found nothing so far. Um, it's, I, I don't think it's quite time to get worried yet. I think in, in the book, I describe it as a bit like a game of hide and seek, right? Where you, you kind of systematically go around and you exhaust all the different rooms looking for the hiding place. And in science, you know, we have different models and different theories for what dark matter could be. And we're, we're sort of systematically going through and checking them off. There's a lot of the, the house left to search, right? There's a lot of places. There are also things that dark matter could be that would explain why we haven't found it yet. So I don't think it's quite time to get worried. Um, if we're still here in 30 years, um, then yes, maybe <laughs> maybe we start to get a bit worried. But um, And as of right now, yeah, we haven't found dark matter, but we, we, I don't think we're worrying just yet. I want to move on to, to another subject, which is a, a similar name. Um, but it makes the, the hunt for dark matter seem easy. They are not relatable, as far as we know, not directly related. Dark energy. Now, we, we talked originally about the theory of the steady state, then the Big Bang, and then the expanding universe, and then the universe would get bigger or maybe start collapsing in on itself. But what suggests dark energy is another phenomenon, that the universe is actually moving, expanding faster rather than slowing down. Right, yes, I think this is this is one of the most surprising things to come out of cosmology in the last few decades. So when I was in school, um, I think the prevailing idea was that, yes, the universe is expanding right now, but in the future, it will probably collapse down, right? Because all the gravity of the stuff in the universe will be trying to pull it back together. And so uh, there were a couple of projects then in the 1990s to try and measure exactly how fast the universe was expanding and then trying to work out at what point would it stop expanding and come back together for what was known as a big crunch, like the opposite of the Big Bang. And the results of the experiment was that the universe is in fact not slowing down, but it's getting faster and faster and faster, like something is stepping on the accelerator pedal of the universe and pushing it apart at increasing speed. Um, we don't really know what that is. We call the effect dark energy. Um, it acts like it is this sort of energy in the universe or even something built into space itself um, that is sort of pushing out and expanding the universe faster and faster and faster. Um, we know even less about dark energy than we do about dark matter. Um, it's slightly confusing. They have the same name. You know, you hear dark energy and you thought you hear dark matter and you think, okay, they're going to be sort of related. They're completely not. And I think it's just astronomers bad habits of using dark to mean, you know, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I suppose the, the thing they, they also have in common is that um, they, uh, if we don't find them, if they're not there, then we have to tear up just about every theory we have, if, if, every model we have of how the universe works. Well, right. So, so there are. We wouldn't have to tear up every model. There are alternate models. Um, so, uh, a big alternate to dark matter is this theory called MOND, known as modified Newtonian dynamics. So, you know, if we go step, go back to dark matter for a second. Yeah, dark matter is this finding that everything in the universe seems to be acting as this, as if there was a bunch of invisible stuff kind of glue, holding it together gravitationally. Um, an alternative explanation for what we see sometimes is the idea that gravity might just behave a bit differently, right? Like maybe gravity, uh, you know, has extra extra bits that we don't see here on Earth because, um, you know, we're, we're just, you know, we're too dense or whatever. Um, the same is true of dark energy. Like maybe the, the answer is that gravity on short scales pulls things together, but on very, very long scales pushes, pushes things apart. Um, 
That's probably unlikely. I think people have been trying to tinker with the equations of gravity for decades now and have never been able to come up with something sort of consistent. So our best guess right now is that dark energy is some sort of new energy in the universe or like maybe even something kind of built into the fabric of the universe. This is something that Einstein first came up with the idea of. Um, he called it the cosmological constant. There's this idea that the space and time itself might have some sort of natural springy push to it. Um, which is causing the universe to accelerate faster and faster. And he he then decided that was that didn't work, and he disowned it and said it was his biggest mistake. And now it turns out, even though he thought he was wrong, he may have been right after all. Well, yes, exactly. It's, it's, yeah, it's one of these sort of historically ironic things, right? So if we go back, remember when Einstein invented his theory of relativity that was before we knew that the universe was expanding right and so the prevailing wisdom was that the universe stays the same the whole time and so this was a problem for einstein because einstein when he wrote his equations of relativity which describes the universe the equations really seemed to describe a universe that wanted to change with time it was very hard to build a static universe using einstein's equations um, like you could, in theory, kind of balance things out, but it would be unstable in the same way that like a pencil balancing on its tip is unstable, right? If you added one extra atom to Einstein's universe, then it would sort of collapse down. Um, so Einstein invented this new force, which he called the cosmological constant, and it was supposed to be a sort of scaffolding in the universe to keep it, to stop it from collapsing, right? To keep it steady, sort of pushing back against gravity. But then as soon as Hubble discovered the universe was expanding, Einstein realized, okay, well, I don't need the cosmological constant, right? You know, we don't have to hold the universe fixed. The universe is just happily expanding, and that's fine. Uh, but then it turns out the universe is not just expanding, it's actually getting, to, it's going faster and faster and faster. And so Einstein's invention, this sort of force which pushes out of the universe, actually might be a really, really good description of what's going on. It's kind of ironic, like, yeah, like you said, he described it as his greatest mistake, and he, he really might have been wrong. No, he might have been right, even when he thought he was wrong. Which is, is is a lovely thought. It, it's there are many characters come up in this this book which um, I had never heard of before and, and are absolutely fascinating. And people who a bit like Einstein or, or indeed like uh, like Zwicker, you, you were talking about earlier on, who came up with um, ideas which at the time were unprovable, which turned out to be okay. I'm thinking about John Michel. Now he's he, he's somebody of whom you're you're quite fond. What, what did he do? Right, so so yeah, so he was an a, a, a clergyman and sort of a sort of amateur scientist almost, if you if you like. He sort of worked outside traditional academia. Um, he was one of the most kind of brilliant and unsung heroes of scientific history. I think he came up with an enormous amount of stuff, and I think he was described as uh, you know a scientist that who was so ahead of his time he was ignored. <laughs> Right, because like his, his ideas were so prescient, they were just there were so many steps ahead of what everyone was doing. Um, he made really fundamental contributions to things like geology and magnetism and all kinds of science. But the, one of his most famous predictions, I think, was black holes. And he came up with this in the 1700s. He came up with this idea that if a star was big enough, in theory, um, you know, the, the, the gravity at the surface would pull all the light back in, and so you wouldn't be able to see the stars. He invented this idea of an object in the universe massive enough to sort of swallow light, and he realized that would be invisible. Um, I think he called them dark stars rather than dark holes, but like the fundamental idea is exactly what we what we go with today. Um, he even came up with a way of detecting them, which is the way that we found them uh, like in modern times. He realized if you have a binary system, so you have a dark star orbiting a regular star, what you would actually see would be the regular star just orbiting nothingness. And like this was his test. He said, okay, if you ever see this, a normal star orbiting nothingness, that's what you found there is a dark star. And that does actually work. Um, the Nobel Prize in Physics a couple of years ago went to a couple of researchers, Andrea Gez and Reinhard Genzel, who studied the stars in the center of our Milky Way galaxy and saw them all orbiting nothingness because there's a black hole in the center of our galaxy. And it's exactly what, uh, what he predicted uh, hundreds of years ago. Like, an incredibly forward-thinking guy. It, it is remarkable. No, everything we've talked about now, we've only got about, about a minute left, sadly, but everything we've talked about now, up till now, has been on the electromagnetic spectrum. Gravitational waves are above and beyond and beneath and, and, and through that. And yet they could be one of the most exciting media that we can use for astronomy in the future. 
Absolutely, yeah. I think gravitational waves are a revolutionary new way to study the universe. Um, they, they come straight from the theory of, of relativity. Um, as soon as you like accept Einstein's universe of stretchy, flexible space and time, it sort of makes sense that you can have waves in that stretchy, flexible medium in the same ways that you can have waves in a trampoline or rubber sheet. And very energetic events like black holes colliding will set up ripples in space and time. And so we, we detected the first ever gravitational wave. And I, I say we, I mean sort of the human race, right? I wasn't involved in this work. Um, you know, so like, you know, the human race, we detected our first ever gravitational wave in 2015. Um, so it, it's a brand new field of science. I think it, it, it has the potential to be as revolutionary as almost anything else in the history of astronomy. I think, I think, I think the coming century might very well be a gravitational wave century. It's a great time to be a public astronomer. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew Bothwell. I just should just say the invisible universe, why there's more to reality than meets the eye. It's available online uh, from the Wigton Book Festival shop itself. And I'd like to say on behalf of the audience as well, thank you very much, Matt Bothwell. Well, yeah, th thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ken. Thank you, Wigtown. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, to come here and talk today. Thank you.